welcome you to week two of a series that we began last week called Rest, God's Gift to Us. Last week we kicked off this series by looking at the invitation that Jesus offers all of us. It's an invitation to come to Him and find spiritual rest. It's an invitation to take His yoke and find emotional rest. And finally it's an invitation to learn that His yoke is easy. And if you missed that message, I just want to encourage you, if you have opportunity, go to the church website, watch it. It will give you a new perspective and I believe a new appreciation of what Jesus made possible for you when he died on the cross and rose again. Today we are going to continue this series by looking at Matthew 12, verses 1 through 8 in a message that I've titled, The Opposition. So let's Read what Matthew writes here, beginning in verse number 1. It says, At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry. They began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. And he answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple desecrate the day and yet are innocent? I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. One of the things that Jesus faced while he was on this earth was opposition. Nearly every time that Jesus did something, it was met with disapproval, it was met with resistance by a group of religious leaders known as the Pharisees. And the word Pharisee itself means separated. And so this was a group of men who saw themselves as set apart from all other Jews because of the way that they kept the law. And as we're going to see today, the reality is that they really didn't keep the law. What they kept was their traditions and their interpretations of the law. When you read through the New Testament, you discover that Jesus rebuked the Pharisees more than he rebuked anyone else. And, I mean, just read the New Testament sometime and just try to make a conscious effort to, to really focus in on how many times Jesus rebuke the Pharisees, and you will see that he rebuked them more than he rebuked anyone else. And let me just share with you just uh, a couple of verses that show this uh, rebuke by Jesus to the Pharisees. Uh, Matthew 23, 27, Jesus had this to say to the Pharisees. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. Now, how many of you would want Jesus to say that about you? <laughs> to call you a hypocrite and to say that you're like a whitewashed tomb. Jesus calls the Pharisees hypocrites. He calls them whitewashed tombs. And then uh, if you go down just a few verses in verse 33 of Matthew 23, he calls them, listen to this, snakes and a brood of vipers. Now, if the Pharisees were keepers of the law of God, if in fact they actually kept the law of God like God wanted them to keep it, Jesus wouldn't have rebuked them in such a way. I mean, he wouldn't call them snakes, he wouldn't call them a brood of vipers, he wouldn't call them hypocrites, he wouldn't call them whitewashed tombs. He would have commended them, but instead he condemned them. And so Jesus' greatest opposition came from religious people. And I believe that Jesus' greatest opposition today still comes from religious people. You know, so many times we think that the greatest opposition that Jesus faces is from sinners and sinful people and people who are, don't know God and have no concept of God. And, and, you know, the reality is I think so many times the greatest opposition that, that Jesus faces is actually from people who go to church. That's how it was back then, and, and I don't think much has changed today. 
People who have a form of godliness but deny its power. People who oppose the will of God by placing their traditions as equal or as higher than the will of God and defending them as such. And here in Matthew 12, we find such opposition by the Pharisees regarding the Sabbath. Look again what Matthew writes in verses 1 and 2. Matthew says, at, the at that time, Jesus went through the, the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry. And he began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. And when the Pharisees saw this, they couldn't believe it. They said, look, just look. Your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Now, that's quite an accusation, isn't it? To tell Jesus, the Son of God, that his followers are doing something that opposes the law of God, that's really quite an accusation. Well, let's go back to the original command that God gave concerning the Sabbath. You'll find it in Exodus 20. It's the fourth commandment found in the Ten Commandments. And this is what it actually says. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Now, that's a pretty simple command. Work six days, rest one. Now, the idea is that on this day of rest, one would cease from what they had been doing the previous six days. And so, in other words, it would, it would be a day where one would change their, their routine in order to be renewed and, and refreshed. You know, sometimes it's just good to get out of the routine of things, isn't it? And God knows that better than anyone. He knows that we're just dust. And so he knows that we can't go seven days doing the same thing over and over and over again, or it's just not going to be good for us. And so he says, six days I want you to rest, but on the seventh day you need to change your, you need to change your routine. You need to change it. And so he sets forth this Sabbath day. Well, the Pharisees, they took this one simple command of God. And again, it was just a really simple command to rest. And they added so many regulations to it that it became a heavy burden for the Jews. You see, the Pharisees, what they, what they began to do is they began to define what was considered work and what wasn't. The Talmud, the book of Jewish traditions, has 24 chapters. 24 long chapters devoted to what the Jews could and couldn't do on the Sabbath. And let me, just, let me just share a few with you. Here's some of the things that the Pharisees added to this simple command of God. You could not travel more than 3,000 feet from your house. A lot of us would be out of luck. You could not carry anything that weighed more than a dried fig, but if the object weighed half that amount, you could carry it twice. You couldn't carry a needle for fear you might sew something. Wouldn't have that problem. Listen to this one. You couldn't take a bath because you might accidentally splash water on the floor and that would be washing the floor. Women couldn't look in the mirror because they might pull out a gray hair. You can't make this stuff up. I'm telling you. This is, this is. You think that one's funny? Listen to this one. Some of you are just going uh, to... False teeth could not be worn because they exceeded the weight limit for carrying burdens. <laughs> this is serious. I mean, come on. And there were many more... Like that. I mean, the Pharisees, they had so many Sabbath day restrictions. And to us, we sit here and we're like, that's, that's just ridiculous. I'm not going to ask you, but I know some of you have got your false teeth in today, right? You might have been able to do that. Huh? How many of you check to see if you any gray hairs? Or you? Huh? Okay. And so by adding all these rules, all these regulations to the Sabbath, the Pharisees, you know what they did? They actually made the Jews work harder at trying not to work on the Sabbath than they did at their jobs the other six days of the week. 
See, religion takes what God has made simple and makes it complex. That's what religion does. And in doing so, it doesn't leave any room for rest. And I'm really convinced that the reason so many people walk away from the church is because they have been worn out by religion. Because it's a heavy burden to try and carry around and try to follow. And so the Pharisees, they, they accuse Jesus' disciples of doing something unlawful on the Sabbath when they see them pick some heads of grain and eat them. Now, here's my question. What were the Pharisees doing in the grain field anyway? <laughs> Remember, by their own rules and by their own regulations, they weren't supposed to travel any more than 3,000 feet from their house. Now do you see why Jesus called them hypocrites? You see, the disciples weren't in any way doing anything unlawful. They were doing what was permissible by Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath. And so in response to the Pharisees' accusation, Jesus reveals three important truths about the Sabbath. And I want to share them with you. Number one, the Sabbath was not intended to restrict necessities of life. In verses 3 and 4 we read, Jesus answered, Have you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. I love how Jesus comes back at these guys. Jesus asked them, have you not read what David did? These guys, they were Old Testament scholars. They had read all about David. David was their hero. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus points to the actions of their hero to justify the actions of his disciples. I love that. Jesus, he refers the Pharisees back to a day when David and his companions were fleeing from Saul. They had come to the town of Nob and they, they're hungry. And so David goes to Ahimelech, the priest, and he asks for five loaves of bread or whatever he could find. Because when you're hungry, you'll eat about anything. And they were hungry. And so David says, listen, just give us five loaves of bread or anything you find. We'll be grateful. We're hungry. Well, Ahimelech, he tells David, I don't have any ordinary bread. There's just none around. But I do have some consecrated bread. And you'll find the story in 1 Samuel 21.4 if you're interested in reading it sometime. Now, Ahimelech refers to the consecrated bread. I want you to listen to what Leviticus has to say about the consecrated bread. Leviticus 24, 8, 9, it says, This bread is to be set out before the Lord regularly, Sabbath after Sabbath, on behalf of the Israelites, as a lasting covenant. And here's the important part. It belongs to Aaron and his sons. In other words, it belongs to the priests. It doesn't belong to everyone else. It belongs to the priests. And so according to Levitical law, only the priests were to eat this consecrated bread. And what does David and his companions do? They eat it. They're hungry. And they eat the consecrated bread. God doesn't strike them dead. God doesn't reprimand them. On the contrary, Jesus uses the actions of David to justify the actions of his disciples. See, the point Jesus was making here to the Pharisees was that the Sabbath was never intended to restrict the necessities of life. Never. And I want to tell you, eating is a necessity. Now, we could argue how much, right? But I mean, eating is a necessity. I mean, if you don't eat, eventually what's going to happen? Right. And so then you know it's a necessity. Okay? And so the Sabbath was never, ever intended by God to restrict such necessities as eating. The Sabbath was all about God's compassion to his people. When you think about the Sabbath, you need to think compassion. Compassion to his people. And how compassionate would it be if the Sabbath confined us to the point that you couldn't even enjoy the necessities of life? That's not compassion. And that was the Pharisees. They were so restricted that they wouldn't even allow people to enjoy the necessities of life. They had it all wrong, and, and Jesus is like, listen, guys, the, the Sabbath is all about my compassion of my people. It's not about restricting necessities of life. If it was all right for David to eat up the consecrated bread because he was hungry, it's certainly all right for my disciples to pluck a few grain in the grain field. 
See, Jesus in no way was condoning disobedience to God's law. I want you to hear this. He's not condoning disobedience to God's law. He was merely emphasizing the need for discernment and compassion in enforcing them. And that's where religion goes wrong. Religion has no discernment, no compassion when it comes to enforcing the laws of God. <clears throat> See, the Sabbath was not intended to restrict necessities of life. Jesus wants us to know that. He wanted the Pharisees to know that. His disciples were not in error. It's like David, their hero, was not in error when they did what they did that day in Nob. And so that's the first truth that Jesus points out about the Sabbath. Here's the second one. The Sabbath was not intended to, to restrict service to God. Jesus continues in verse 5. He said, Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple desecrate the day and yet are innocent? Jesus is like, hey guys, have you ever noticed how the priests work on the Sabbath? I mean, has that ever hit you how much they work on the Sabbath? Even though they do, they're not considered guilty before God. They're considered innocent before God. Have you ever noticed that? Well, the Pharisees, they, they were all about the letter of the law. And so Jesus, he's trying to get them to see that by their standard, by their own standard, the priests would be guilty of violating the Sabbath because they were working. But here's the deal. The purpose of the Sabbath was to rest in God's provision. And everything the priests did in the temple on the Sabbath, it emphasized the provision of God that allowed man to rest in God. Lighting the fire, killing the sacrificial animals, placing the animals on the altar was work done by the priests. Why? It emphasized the provision of God. See, their Sabbath work was service to God. Jesus always emphasized the intent of the law. He always emphasized the meaning behind the law. And the intent of the Sabbath was not to restrict service to God. The intent of the Sabbath was for people to rest in God's provision. You see, the truth of the matter is that just because a person was working on the Sabbath didn't mean they were not resting in God's provision. And just because a person wasn't working on the Sabbath didn't mean they were resting in God's provision. The Pharisees restricted their work on the Sabbath, didn't they? At least they appeared to. Again, they walked 3,000 feet to the grain fields. But supposedly they restricted their work on the Sabbath, but they, but they in no way were resting in God's provision in doing so. They weren't resting in God's provision. They were resting in what they could do, what they could keep. And the problem with the Pharisees was that they failed to see the spirit of the law. And as a result, they, they demanded that the letter of the law and the interpretation and their interpretation of it be obeyed by everyone, without exception. Jesus goes on to say to the Pharisees in verse 6, he said, I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. See, the Pharisees... They were so focused on religious rituals and they were so focused on rules and regulations that they missed the whole purpose of the temple. The purpose of the temple was to remind people of their need of God. That was the purpose of the temple. It was a place where the priests would make intercession for the people. It was, it was a place where sacrifices were laid down on an altar for the forgiveness of sin. And, and Jesus wanted the Pharisees to know that he was greater than the temple. You know, everything the temple symbolized, Jesus became in reality. Everything that the temple symbolized, Jesus became in reality. Jesus reminds us of our need of God. Jesus is the one we worship. He, he's the great high priest that intercedes for us. Jesus is the one that lay down his life on the altar of the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Everything done in the temple pointed to the one greater than the temple, Jesus Christ. Amen. The problem with the Pharisees and with so many people today is that they become so focused on the methods of worship that they miss worshiping God altogether. Amen. I wonder how often that happens with us. 
See, everything we do when we come to this place should lead us to worship Jesus. Everything. But I'm afraid sometimes we get so focused on our methods of worship and our traditions of worship that we miss out on worshiping Jesus altogether. And that was the Pharisees. They were so hung up on their methods and their traditions and their rules and their regulations that they didn't even see that there was one greater than the temple in their midst, Jesus himself. They didn't worship him. I wonder how often that happens today with us. Our worship of Jesus is found in our service to him. The Sabbath was not intended to restrict necessity of life. The Sabbath was not intended to restrict service to God. And finally, the Sabbath was not intended to restrict mercy. Jesus continues in verse 7. He said, if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. Jesus is referencing Hosea 6.6. 6. It was a scripture the Pharisees knew well. Again, these guys were Old Testament scholars. But it was obvious by their condemnation of Jesus' as disciples that they didn't understand what it meant. Let me, let me read to you what it says. Hosea 6.6. 6. It says, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. See, the manner in which the Pharisees observed the Sabbath was sac it was sacrifice. I mean, they sacrificed their normal routine. They gave up all kinds of things in the name of the Sabbath. They had the whole sacrifice thing down. But the only problem is that Jesus desired something greater than sacrifice, and that was mercy. And while the disciples may not have had the whole sacrifice thing down like the Pharisees required, they did have the whole mercy thing down as God desired. And so in the eyes of God, the disciples were innocent while the Pharisees were guilty. See, at the end of the day, here's what we have to remember. God always looks at the heart when considering man's innocent or guilty. Always. You know we can do the right thing with the wrong motive in our heart? We can, do the, we can do the right thing with the wrong motive. And if we do the right thing with the wrong motive in our heart, guess how God sees us? Anybody want to take a guess how God sees it? He sees us as guilty. You see, if doing the right thing was the only thing that God considered, the Pharisees would have been commended by Jesus. Jesus, but instead they were condemned by Jesus. Why? Because God always judges according to the desires and motives of the heart, and Jesus knew the Pharisees' hearts were far from God. The disciples had done something the Pharisees hadn't. They had acknowledged Jesus as Lord in their hearts, and one of the ways that it was evident was by the mercy that they showed up. Remember that the Sabbath was all about God's compassion to man. You'll hear me say that over and over again. That's what it was about, God's compassion to man. And if the Sabbath is all about God's compassion, then it only makes sense that one of the things man would show others on the Sabbath would be mercy, compassion toward those suffering. You see, showing kindness toward those in suffering and a desire to help them was a good and right thing to do any, of the day, any day of the week, but particularly on the Sabbath day of the week. And Jesus, he wanted the Pharisees to know the desire of his heart above all things was mercy. They didn't have it, but the disciples did I mean, really, honestly, and truly, at the end of the day, so we drive to church and we come to church on Sunday morning. What if somebody needs us to show mercy to them when we leave this place? And we say, well, I went to church, and, and that's good, but I don't have to show mercy. What does God say? He said, well, those people sacrificed. I mean, they gave up. 
you know, two hours, two and a half hours, three hours of their time to come to church on Sunday morning, but they didn't show mercy to someone who needed to have, to have mercy shown to them. You know what God says? I desire mercy above sacrifice. <coughs> We've got to get that right. We've got to get it right. The disciples had it right. The Pharisees didn't. I want to be more like the disciples and less like the Pharisees. How about you? So the Sabbath was not intended to restrict mercy. Now, in conclusion, and when you hear me say in conclusion, you're getting very, very excited, but I want you to know I still have a few more things to say in conclusion, all right? <laughs> but in conclusion, I just want to say a few words about the Sabbath as it relates to us. See, the reality is that we live in the age of grace. and We don't live under the age of the law. And as a result, the Sabbath laws are not something we base our lives around. We base our lives around what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's what we base our lives around. And according to Colossians 2, 16 and 17, the Sabbath requirements were part of the regulations that Jesus removed by nailing them. Listen to what it says. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Don't let anybody judge you. These were a shadow of the things that were to come. And I referenced that earlier when I said everything was done in the temple. It was kind of a shadow, a foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ would fulfill by his death on the cross. Paul says, these were a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Found in Christ. Today we need to understand that when we rest in Jesus Christ for our salvation, we fulfill the Sabbath requirement. It's fulfilled when we rest in Jesus Christ for our salvation. Jesus said he didn't come to do away with the law of Moses, but that he came to fulfill it. So when we rest in, his, in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for our salvation, when we do that, the Sabbath law, according to the Bible, the Sabbath law is fulfilled. Now, I realize that some of you might believe that Sunday's our Sabbath. It's not. It's not. Nowhere in the New Testament will you find the first day of the week being designated as the Sabbath. You will not find those words. In fact, I want you to hear this. In fact, during the first three centuries of Christianity, there is no record that Christians treated Sunday like the Jewish Sabbath. And then Constantine, he did something. Constantine legalized Christianity in 313 AD. And he really imposed more pagan influence on Christianity than Christian influence on paganism. For example, in the year 321 AD, Constantine, he issued... An edict, and this is what it said. Now listen to this. This was Constantine. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. You want to know where the blue laws came from? Those of you who remember the blue laws, it goes back to what Constantine said. Right here. Okay? Now, I don't remember much about the blue laws, but I've heard about the blue laws. <laughs> and I've read about the blue laws. And one of the things I, I, I read this week in, in, in preparing was that, how, what are they called blue laws? Anybody know? It's thought that possibly because the people wouldn't turn on, like in the wintertime, people would not turn on their, their heaters. They wouldn't light their, their, their fires because that was considered work. And therefore they had, guess what? Blue noses. Therefore, we've got blue laws. I don't know if that sounds good to me, though. How about you? <laughs> but I want you to hear this today. The very name Sunday, the very name Sunday is named after, after the worship of Saul, Saul Invictus, the sun god. 
our calendar is not based off Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. It's not based off the Bible. Sunday, according to Constantine, was to be a day where we set aside what we normally do and we, we, we rest and we have our workshops closed. So this is kind of how Sunday evolved into the Christian Sabbath, but it's not something the Bible declares. Now, don't tune me out quite yet. Because I say all of that to say this. And this is important. While the Bible doesn't declare Sunday to be a Christian Sabbath, I do believe this. I believe that Jesus' resurrection made the first day of the week unique in and of itself. I believe that. In places such as Acts 20, verse 7, in places such, such as 1 Corinthians 16, 2, we find God's people coming together on the first day of the week. You cannot deny that. If you'll look in Scripture, you'll not deny that God's people came together on the first day of the week. Now, I think there's something to be said about God's people coming together on the first day of the week to celebrate Jesus' resurrection and the rest that it made possible for us. <coughs> We just have to be careful to not be legalistic about it because when it because when we are, it becomes something that God never intended for it to be. A heavy burden. A heavy burden. Again, I think sometimes the reason some people leave organized religion, Christianity, whatever you want to call it is because they feel such a heavy burden because we turn things into something God never intended for them to be. And so we need to be very, very careful not to be like the Pharisees. I love this. In the Old Covenant, the people worked first and then rested. And that's why the Sabbath was the last day of the week. In the New Covenant, however, it's just the opposite. We rest in Jesus Christ first as demonstrated by coming together the first day of the week. And then what do we do? We work. And so today we look to the Sabbath. We look to it. But we do so not out of duty, but rather delight. You see, for in the Sabbath we see a foreshadowing of the rest that is found in Jesus Christ and so when we look at the Sabbath, it ought to bring a smile to our face. When we think about coming together with God's, God's people on the first day of the week, you know what? It shouldn't be a heavy burden. But let's, let's be honest. For some of us, it, it, it's a heavy burden. Because we see it more as a duty than we do a delight. And it should be such a delight to be able to say, God... We come to this place on the first day of the week to recognize that you did everything that needed to be done when you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross. It is finished. It's over. There's no more work to be done for salvation. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Listen, I'm resting in that. And so I gladly come, not out of duty, but out of delight, because I recognize what you did for me. I don't want Simon to be a heavy burden. For anybody. But you know who makes it a heavy burden? Not Jesus. Man makes it a heavy burden. When they begin to place restrictions that Jesus himself never placed. So we've got to be careful. We've got to be so very careful that we don't be like the Pharisees when it comes to our Sunday. Which again, it's not our Sabbath. But it is the first day of the week when Jesus Christ arose and so we come together to celebrate all that means for us and what it doesn't mean for us and what it doesn't mean for us it doesn't mean that we doesn't mean that we doesn't mean that we just give up and say you know what I, I don't have to do anything I don't have to do anything listen we work not because we're trying to earn our salvation listen we work because we have been saved Amen. Amen. 
Now, just think about this for just a moment. I'm closing up. I really am. We, as God's people, can become so legalistic when it comes to Sunday. And some of the things that we say, well, they should do that, they should do that. They should, they should. Let me just ask you this. If we really believe that, if we really believe that, why would any of us ever go to a grocery store? Why would any of us ever go to a restaurant on Sunday if we really believe that? Because people are working. And yet we're so quick. Maybe when somebody's mowing their yard. You know, maybe it's the only day they can. I don't know about you, but there were times. I didn't mow on Sunday. You all be proud of me. But there were days this summer where I will tell you, I was here, I was at the office, I, I could not mow my yard during the week. Saturday would come, and you know, every day of the week it had not rained. And then Saturday came. And I know my neighbors thought I was trying to start a farm. My grass was getting really, really high. I didn't dare go out and mow my yard. But what if I would? I'm just saying, we got to be more careful about those kind of things because God always looks at our heart. Always looks at our heart. And I just knew that one of my friendly neighbors would have just said, Hey, what are you doing mowing your yard, neighbor? Well, you didn't mow it for me, neighbor. Where's your mercy? Where's your compassion? All right. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around. Listen. Jesus gave us this day of rest to get out of the routine of things. To change things up so that we can be renewed and refreshed and just remember what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross. And so if you're here today and you have never entered into that spiritual rest, you've never turned in repentance and placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, listen, I want to invite you to do that during this time of invitation. I'm going to be down here, and if you've never made that decision, would you just come, would you just take me by the hand and say, Travis, I need to be saved. I've never trusted in Jesus Christ. Maybe today you just need to come and lay down your heavy burden. You've been trying to live up to all the rules and restrictions of religion, and it's wore you out. You just need to say, Jesus, you know my heart, and I'm just resting in you today. Listen, whatever decision you need to make, I want to invite you to do it. Let's just be, let's be doers of the word today and not just hearers of the word. If you have a decision relating to this church, maybe you want to come and be a part of this family, we'd love to have you. Whatever decision the Lord is impressing upon your heart, you come in just a few moments. Father, thank you so much for your word. I thank you. I thank you that you gave us a day of rest. And I thank you for what it means. And I thank you that it's all about compassion. And how we find our rest in Jesus. That we don't have to continue to strive because we can just trust in you. And even if we take one day off, we don't have to worry because you've been, you've promised that you're going to be faithful to us. We don't have to strive and strive and strive because you provide. And I just thank you, Father, for the freedom that comes when we truly understand the rest that we have in Jesus. And so I pray for everyone here today who's carrying around a heavy burden. Not because you put it on, but because so many times we, as your people, put heavy burdens on other people. So help us today not to be fat. Help us to find rest in you. For that one who's struggling today, they know that they need to turn to repentance and place their faith and trust in Jesus. I pray that today would be their day of salvation for your glory. Thank you for everyone that's here. I pray that each one would be able to walk away encouraged today of the rest that they have in Jesus. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll stand as we sing, any decision, I invite you to come right now. Please.